Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Wirex Crypto Podcast. I'm your host, Liana, and I'm very happy to introduce our guest for today, Alexandra Obaha, founder of Thrill Labs. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you so much, Liana. I'm really, really pleased to be here. Thank you so much for the wonderful invite. And in fact, I'm thrilled to, uh, to join you. Thank you so much. Thank you. In this episode, Alexandra will share her insights on doing business in Web3, the balance between decentralization and control, and how the industry can become more fair and inclusive. Um, so first, Alexandra, let's just start with, you know, how you got into the Web3 space and a little bit about your background. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. So first of all, um, it might be interesting to know that I'm Dutch uh, by nationality, but I've been based out of Italy, calling uh, in from Italy since uh, about 10 years now. It's already a little while. I really started to tap my toes into the crypto space from 2017. I studied a lot. Uh, initially, I wanted to enter academia. That's why I pursued uh, three academic uh, degrees, mostly in law, uh, political science, and international relations. And that actually ties in with my answer as to why I kind of like slowly, slowly joined the crypto space because I started trading and investing in crypto in 2017. Uh, initially, really, really interested by the idea of how Bitcoin could yeah, improve society. And really, right after the banking crisis of 2008, I, um, yeah, I, I was really like staggered by the impacts uh, across societies, also from a political perspective. And I slowly, slowly started to realize how crypto could change the world, so to say. So I started investing a bit also to hopefully pay back my big uh, study debt uh, one day. And over time, since 2017, um, I actually realized, as I said, that crypto and blockchain, as I soon uncovered, was the underlying um, technological layer, uh, could really change the world. Um, when I spoke just now about my academic kind of perceived pathway and um, I wanted to enter academia researching the intersection between AI and legal and political institutions and I came a couple of years ago to the conclusion that actually yes AI is interesting a general purpose technology but it's actually blockchain web 3 that I wanted to work in so long story short I, uh, I managed to onboard the blockchain industry landed a job a couple of years ago for a UK blockchain startup and yeah, started to work basically uh, from there in the space. Um, saw and observed some of the problems that we're encountering uh, in business and in Web3. We are interacting and doing business with one another. And that then subsequently led me to uh, found my own company and try to build a solution for uh, basically, yeah, business in Web3. We really aim with Thrill Labs to make business in Web3 better, uh, more streamlined and also fairer, but maybe we'll get to that uh, later on as well. Yeah. Yeah. I really resonate with, you know, uh, what you said about crypto and blockchain uh, changing the world, right? But let's unpack what doing business in the Web3 space really is. So, you know, how does doing business in the Web3 space really work? Can you, can you tell us? Oh, I can try to do my best. I can try to do my best. I'm definitely not an all-knowing oracle, but what I can share are my own personal experience, right? Onboarding um, the business space, especially as a business developer initially, uh, and now running my own business as a founder and also running a business that by its very nature regards business uh, in Web3. So I'll get to that in a second. What I would probably say as kind of like a preliminary remark is that I believe that doing business in Web3, so interacting with one another, like for collaborations or transactions and whatnot, and building a business uh, are of course two different things, right? That is really important to keep in mind. I think that ultimately, if we're looking at the latter, so building businesses, um, I believe that most of us who are building are building more or less decentralized structures, really where people, you know, like you and me, or people like developers, investors, or operational, uh, entities uh, really kind of like collaborate with one another in this decentralized global space, which I think is really, really interesting. But, and here comes the but, I think that where we have all these people collaborating and working with one another globally, right? What we really see is that business is still being conducted, even in Web3 and maybe even especially in Web3 by humans, right? And that makes it not flawless. That makes it susceptible to negotiation and interest and interactions between people. And long story short, what I really think is that despite this 
aim that we're having as builders in this space, right, of creating trustless systems through technology, through blockchain, right, through all the wonderful applications that we're building, we're still doing business with one another. So economic incentives, investments, and really, as I said, interest, especially powerful actors, are really, really key in this decentralized so-called trustless kind of system that we're building with one another. And how does that translate in reality, right? Because this is all really conceptual. I'm kind of like a conceptual thinker as a as a lawyer and political scientist. So make that a bit more tangible. I think that what we see, and also me, right, when, when I'm doing business with Troll Labs, is that we really do need to still be engaging with centralized entities, uh, with individuals that have key decision-making power over us and over our businesses, such as venture capital firms, regulatory entities, banks, um, centralized cloud providers could also be an example. And this is, I think, why we have this ongoing in business, this ongoing tension between, on the one hand, indeed, the ideas and the values of decentralization and really the practicalities. Another thing that I do want to quickly mention here as well is the idea that Web3, of course, takes out intermediaries, right? Uh, from our societies, be it that we're looking at financial infrastructure or new technological applications that allow for new use cases, right? But in Web3, in business, in Web3, intermediaries are still very, very important. You have the brokers, you have uh, other types of people who kind of like take cuts out of deals. And I think that's all really, really important to take into account when you're doing business, but also when you're building businesses in Web3. So. Just to sum that up, I think that we don't have only the technological ideals and the decentralized technological infrastructures underpinning businesses, but also, of course, the interest of powerful actors, of intermediaries and other kind of like entities that we, however, have to uh, do business with. So, yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah. So, I mean, in a way, it's like it's business as usual, but slightly different, right? And I, you know... Web3, what I loved about Web3 was the potential and, and the ethos behind it, right? Like, um, you know, collaboration over competition. But at the same time, you know, you do need a little bit of competition, right? Um, in order to better yourself. But, you know, so how does the public's perception of Web3 and decentralization differ from the actual workings of these systems? Because I think, you know, there's, there's quite a lot to unpack here as well, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And by the way, I loved your remark about the whole idea of competition, uh, which is, again, another like kind of like small paradox here, right? We do want an open and transparent kind of system where people collaborate uh, even with different projects and we, you know, tap into each other's open source code. But then on the other hand, you have the whole idea of competition where the market really decides who ultimately wins, especially where financial interests come in and investments from external resources. There is this inherent tension again. But to go to your question, to think about right the public's perception of Web3, uh, I think that we can probably distinguish between maybe informed people, if we want to call them like that. So people who really know what's going on in Web3, who are maybe really believers in the system. And what I kind of like observe in my own engagement with people is that they're almost really informed by this idea of technological determinism, right? So really the idea that tech, and in this case, Web3 infrastructure can kind of like dictate where society goes to for the better, right? And I I am also to a great extent a believer in, in this very uh, notion as well. We really see here as well that, you know, the belief in that Web3 promises, again, to shift this trust from institutions in the past uh, to code. And what is really perhaps different here is that, again, we see decentralization really as an evolving goal so that in practice, businesses, again, as already stated, depend on powerful actors, on centralized systems, I have that as well, right? I really w want currently to build um, a decentralized company, uh, but where do you start? Governance systems, uh, what type of what type of money you and from whom you take it or don't take it? The type of um, maybe even hosting where you uh, create your data and where you deploy your website and your platform. So, long story short, I think that the informed public kind of like has this idea that sometimes Web3 must or is completely decentralized. 
that we see reality that is not. On the other hand, from a maybe other perspective, we're speaking about maybe, let's say, the external observers. So those who are adopting or speaking about Web3, right? A lot of people, I think, maybe think that Web3 applications are so hard to use and that it takes a lot of time to kind of like um, improve one's knowledge about the opportunities that Web3 and crypto and blockchain offer. And that have, has been, of course, very, very true. Uh, definitely up to recently, but I do think that now more and more apps, you know, as we always say, are becoming more and more user-friendly. They start to look similar to Web2 apps. I'm not sure to which extent that is wanted, yes or not, but that those are definitely things that we are observed. Um, so we see this whole kind of idea, this notion growing of Web2.5 and how that is more relatable to um, other people, especially external people, if you want to call them as such. So kind of like your everyday uh, people who doesn't, person who doesn't work in the industry. I'm not sure if this is a good or a bad thing that we kind of like start to replicate Web2 in a way uh, that's up to individuals to decide upon. But yeah, I, as I said, I think that the perception of people very much depends on what type of person we're speaking about and to which extent their notion of Web3 is more or less idealistic or more or less informed by just everyday use cases. Yeah, I, I always kind of uh, say as well that, you know, technology is just a tool, right? But people will be peopling um, and, you know, you can't run away from the different mindsets that people have got, right? And and not everything needs to be decentralized, you know? But then again, we're, we're still building the plane while flying it, you know? So, you know, just kind of leads me to, you know, can striving for decentralization sometimes compromise the efficiency and speed in Web3 businesses? Um, and how can companies manage this balance? You know, I, Liana, I really love what you just mentioned about tech being a tool. Because almost doesn't have to go for almost any type of technology. As I said, I remember my recent, right, about AI years ago. And really, my conclusion was in two master things is, you know, it's up to us as humans how we use tech. It's nothing deterministic per se. It's up to us how we use the tools and how we make societies and individuals' lives better with them or don't actually, right? The risks are also Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Question, right? About, um, yeah, decentralization, uh, efficiency, speed. I mean, I, I guess I can share a couple of uh, my own thoughts about how I can also manage these types of um, potential tensions, right? Um, I think that, first of all, um, of course, what we can observe is that if we are looking for more decentralization, right, we might actually encounter slower consensus and more complex governance. I think that there are two uh, very uh, straightforward answers to it. That and fundamentally, this slower consensus and more complex governance may also be, to an extent, interrelated. So, just to explain what I really mean is that, of course, from a more technological perspective, right, if you're interacting with the blockchain, you're really just getting information or submitting info, right, on chain. And when it's come really to getting information, as far as I've been told by our dear developers, it's not really different than uh, querying a traditional database, right? That is very, very interesting, especially if there are nowadays more tools and indexes like Etherscan and Polyscan and whatnot to make this process even more easy. And submitting information uh, can, of course, take a little bit longer, and this is very network dependent. So I think that as a company, you want to think about if I'm implementing a blockchain infrastructure within my project, right, within my product, of course, we want to make the right choice in terms of what network do we use. Of course, it takes longer for a transaction to settle on Ethereum or on Solana, right? That is why, for instance, at Thrilled Labs, with our upcoming uh, token, we are actually deciding to go for Solana. But of course, there are a lot of different reasons and um, things that you have to take into account beyond, um, yeah, kind of like slower consensus or faster consensus and um, transaction times. I think that fundamentally, maybe even more interesting uh, in this regard is the other part. So the complex governance, right? I think that if you want to implement decentralization and you want to do so through voting mechanisms, because of course you can also create a token within your business without that there's necessarily voting rights attached to it. But if you want to make the decision-making within a product or company also more decentralized, of course you want to think about, do I want to create some sort of a DAO structure? How do I want to further fragment the power within 
the company today, but also in the future. And as a political scientist, I am always quite aware of path dependencies, right? So that when you make a certain choice, you kind of like remain in that path, sometimes uh, very, very rigidly, and it's very hard to go out of that. That is, for instance, why at Thrilled Labs, I actually initially created it as a Web2 uh, tech infrastructure. And now slowly, slowly, we're moving towards Web3 rather than the other way around. But as a political scientist, as I said, what I kind of like for instance, thought about is in, in the last century, right, in the Netherlands, we had this uh, system of what we called pillarization. And without making this too long, what you really saw is that the political system functioned across different pillars that kind of like represented religious and ideological different layers. For instance, Protestant people, Catholic people, liberal and socialist. And each of those people kind of, and individuals and groups had like their own schools, newspapers and whatnot, right? And why am I mentioning this again from political science? Because of course, what we saw happening, you can imagine, is a fragmented political landscape and really, really hard time of people negotiating with one another, right? Lengthy, lengthy, lengthy processes of coming to consensus. And I'm very wary that this type of fragmentation can also happen within companies, right? It's one thing to have it uh, in a nation state or in a political system uh, where you would arguably even opt for these options, even though it brings its own uh, difficulties and checks and balances and whatnot. But especially if you are you know, running a company, if you want to remain agile, and speedy. Um, I do want to be yeah, very, very agile here that we don't just implement DAOs and dece decentralized decision-making systems for the sake of it. No, ideally we're building a company, we're building products because we want to help people or we want to make money regardless of what your aim really is. So um, I do think that a touch of centralization, especially in the beginning, beginning of companies is not necessarily bad. Of course, <laughs> You don't want to take the hero worshiping kind of avenue either, but yeah, a lot can be said about this topic as you I noticed from this length, the answer. Wow. I really love your answer. And, you know, there's so many gems in there um, from, you know, the fact that you've got to have the right intention. You know, what is your intention in building and in, in, um, having this business, right? And then also um, the fact that, you know, you mentioned about these different, um, the, I would say like, little ecosystem within the uh, political system, you, you know, as you mentioned in, in, in the Netherlands, um, you know, the fragmentation of it, right? Um, and, and sometimes something that we think would work um, looks good on paper, but does it really uh, work in the practical sense, right? So, um, you know, how do you address the irony that decentralization, you know, that's meant to reduce control can sometimes create you know, new forms of power within Web3 businesses. Oh, gosh, yeah. Thank you, Liana, for your kind words. And this is, of course, just yeah, another very, very interesting question. So I will try to give this a bit more brief, but I think that it's really important to take into consideration that if we really want to build decentralized system, be it um, a whole new kind of like state structure or decentralized um, social identity within a really big company, right? or just a decentralized project, right? You need significant resources to build everything, but also to keep them going. Not everyone works for free. Not everyone is the community type of contributor. Um, and even if people are, it's sometimes really, really tricky to keep them involved, to make them full, to make them show up, right? We see that really often today uh, in a lot of DAOs. That's actually, the participation rates are pretty low. But of course, there where you need resources. Again, you need, funding, you need money, be it crypto or uh, fiat currencies. And I think that especially if we as businesses sometimes um, are looking to create our our projects, in, in my case as well, through token launches, what you do see is the risk here that there is fundamentally some sort of a zero sum game where the influx really of capital is on the one hand side necessary to take off or to keep growing the project, but the continuous influx of capital is also kind of like needed to an extent to make token prices go higher. But this can be, of course, external capital or speculation or just profit making, right? From achieving some sort of product market fit. And why am I mentioning this? I think that there will we need capital to grow, right? To grow our token prices. Uh, it can create 
adverse incentives. And we've already been speaking a little bit about that. So wherever there is uh, monetary gains to be made, there will be adverse incentives. And I think that especially in this case, if there is outsiders coming in, such as VCs or other investors or, yeah, I don't want to kind of like go on about VCs too much, but what you do see is that certain VCs may just want to enter into the token early on so that they can have more profits, right? And then they just dump the token around the launch uh, period of the um, of the project, right? Of the token, I should say. And I know even that there is an industry specific kind of like blacklist um, circling around with the names of uh, venture capital firms that actually engage in such products, in such uh, practices, I should say. Um, so this is just actually really one Again, paradox, right? We are introducing with a project, a token to kind of like reduce control, to create this beautiful decentralized ecosystem globally together or within our companies. But still the fact that you need funding, that you need other people as well, banks, you know, again, centralized cloud providers, whatnot. The very fact that you have certain needs at once as a decentralized kind of company creates again, um, yeah, choke points where potential powerful actors can come in and can really influence the um, the progress and the very nature, I, sh I should say, of either the company or of the uh, token. And that doesn't, of course, only go for VCs and external actors. It can also be internal actors, right? There where you have uh, developers who, who are involved with the engineering of the smart contracts. Maybe you have certain founders who have a massive amount of tokens. Uh, and can therefore kind of like exert a centralized power over the, over a project. So still, there's always this inherent small uh, irony creeping in, um, however you want to run it. Yeah, I, I love what you said. And, and you know, it comes back to um, people will always be peopling, you know. Um, and until we kind of um, change mindset or cultivate a humanity first culture within our communities, there's you know, we're always going to find these different players, right? And different actors. And I think it's much needed too, you know, to keep the balance um, of the ecosystem. But then obviously we're also trying to get into a new way of connecting, a new way of collaborating. So in what, you know, in what ways do human behaviors and decision-making influence um, the effectiveness of decentralization in Web3? Yeah, I, I love what you just said about uh, the human nature of things and uh, that the industry is, it, it remains human centered, right? And we've been speaking, well, I've been going on quite a bit about how human behaviors can impact, can impact decentralization for the worse. Uh, we've already been speaking quite extensively about that, but of course, individuals are ultimately building these decentralized structures, right? It was Satoshi who created uh, Bitcoin. It was Gavin Wood who wrote about Web3 as an ideological, uh, social ideological kind of layer. So what I want to say is, is as well, is that we as humans, especially exceptional individuals will take the lead and will dare to create solutions out there. But also the underlying communities will kind of like step up together and really decide from almost like a grassroots perspective that almost some sort of a revolution is needed, right, to create better structures in this world. There's also very positive ways how humans can influence um, decentralization. And to be a bit more specific, right, I think that if we're looking at decentralization from how are we actually going to implement it in today's world, we're speaking more about representation and adoption, right, especially in terms of who are building and who are using the tech. And I think that's what's really interesting to note is that we see so many grassroots community initiatives popping up all across different verticals, all the way from decentralized finance to deep in to a uh, social impact project, but also interestingly, more kind of like political interests coming together, be it in the US, right behind Trump, uh, not saying that I necessarily agree or disagree with that, but also in the UK where it stands uh, for crypto, the, the, the movement that we see happening. So we see also people coming together. and. I think two final things that I would quickly like to mention here as well is, of course, one of the elements in the rooms is education, right? Because without us really knowing about how we can use Web3, I do see sometimes that 
almost like the underlying values and ideological nature of the space tends to be somewhat forgotten. If I look at, I have two half sisters, right? And they know about crypto, but they know about it through influencers that kind of like speak about how you can fast and rapidly make money with crypto, right? On the other hand, I see that technological education in their high schools is almost completely lacking, that girls don't even think that they can become founders as well. At least that is what I'm getting from, from their answers. So I think that education, of course, is key, but also education about why do we need to change society? Why do we all need all this kind of like weird decentralized infrastructures? And a final thing is maybe as well as if we, you know, if we really want to think about our human behaviors as people in this industry, I think that is important to be self-reflective as well. Again, if we see that a lot of female founders are not getting funded, maybe VCs, again, venture capital firms should be a bit more vigilant about that. If we see that uh, we haven't looked or even gathered some massive black swan events that we gathered the, the potential impact of those, right? Think about the collapse of the FTX exchange or whatnot, right? We should always remain very vigilant to the human nature of the space and be aware that we're not flawless and that we can make mistakes, that we can be biased, but that we can also, yeah, influence as individual humans the space uh, for the worst, especially in the case of certain black swan events that are kind of like caused by a small group of individuals. So yeah, there's, I guess, a lot that we can do here in terms of human behavior for the better, but also for the worse. Yeah, you mentioned education and, and I think that is so right. You know, education is so important and, you know, I, I feel like there's not enough education out there. And also sometimes, you know, what is the right education, right? Um, and as a founder and CEO, you know, how would you say centralized, you know, leadership can actually support the goals of decentralized decentralization and in, in Web3 projects, you know, um, and and even if it's contradictory, you know, uh, yeah. So I'd love to to hear your insights on this. Yeah, that's lovely because we can perhaps even at times also have cent centralized leadership in the forms of people who really step up and educate. Um, but from a more, let's say, project perspective, I think that, again, as a preliminary question, we should always think is decentralization of a project or of a company a goal by itself or is it really a means to an end right I, I i personally don't think that decentralization is needed in every project per se hell a lot of projects in the space have tokens that actually don't really have any value right maybe they they are introduced from a community perspective or merely as a speculation and extractive kind of nature and as we have gathered from this long talk so far, decentralization is not always needed. However, there where it is needed, I do think that it can also be introduced by centralized leadership, right? Especially in the early stages of Web3 projects. I noted that um, Throat Labs started off as a Web2 kind of technological infrastructure, but always with the values of Web3 in mind. That is, we don't sell data to third parties. We don't look in people's chats just because we are a business networking app, right? We have strong terms and conditions that I put in place myself. There is no censorship and whatnot. So again, it's like a, almost like a, a gray zone where centralized leadership can still go hand in hand with decentralized kind of like values and where decentralized kind of infrastructures are not always needed nor wanted in my opinion. And I still think that, as I said, we are usually, especially with earlier stage projects, we are in a path to grow and we can change, right? We've seen this once more, also from a political perspective, we've seen that certain really centralized states evolve uh, from monarchies to more democratic and decentralized and distributed systems. We've seen centralized systems going to distributed kind of like federal systems and then changing back again. So I think that that, of course, in a way smaller scale and in a way smaller time period, that can also happen, this gradual shift within projects and companies. And I do think that centralized leadership, of course, always self-reflected, taking into account that you don't want to create some sort of a dictator or a group, small group of founders who hold all the tokens and screw people over. Just to say that's very Dutch. 
you don't want that. Uh, I think it's all like a gradual process and uh, yeah, a gray zone where hopefully people are trying to build for the better and not only to make money and extract value. Yeah, you said something very, very important just now, which is, you know, values. Just because centralized leadership, you know, uh, just because a leadership is centralized doesn't mean it's bad, right? It is the values within that leadership. And and I think, you know, there's a lot to be said about the leadership today because, you know, obviously everyone comes from a very uh, specific mindset because, you know, we've been taught that, right? But then now with this new um, technology and, as you said, revolution, you know, how can we fix the power imbalances in, 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 in the industry? And, you know, how can we make it more fair and inclusive? Just because it's centralized leadership doesn't mean it's bad. But yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a really nice bridge, actually. Uh, I appreciate it. And yeah, once, once more, cent- centralized leadership is not necessarily bad, uh, just as democracies, for instance, by themselves are not necessarily good, right? People can go to vote. And the majority might choose still one centralized kind of like dictator who doesn't respect the rule of law or basic human rights, right? So it's always looking at the details and obsessively kind of like figuring out how systems work, how procedures work, how checks and balances work. And I I keep saying this, but as a lawyer and political scientist, I'm really, really, let's say, yes, enthused and almost obsessed with these types of um, hierarchies and structures that are in place. But anyway... Just to circle back to your question before I lose myself in systemic thinking, um, I think that yes, we're speaking. We've been speaking a bit, uh, let's say, about the imperfections of our industry, right? And that we ultimately want to create a fairer and more inclusive world. I think that for a big part, especially where there where we see that some groups or individuals are not necessarily super much included in the shaping of Web three, such as sometimes women, people from certain places in the world, sometimes um, elderly or maybe disabled people, right? You can think a lot about a lot of different groups. Um, I think that they are um, empowered, that it's important to empower them in terms of uh, those who are currently in power actually being aware that these imperfect access pathways exist. But also it's oftentimes a matter, in my opinion, of us stepping up for ourselves. For instance, we as women, uh, there's a lot of women out there who are currently being more vocal about the fact that it's very hard for women, female founders to raise capital. And I'm coming across that as well. So we can be vocal about that, but definitely we should also be building, not only speaking about taking action, but just building those companies that for instance, in this case, make money or that do good things for the world. Um, So I think that bringing certain topics into people's attention about power imbalances, but also really stepping up for ourselves, even as individuals or indeed just as groups is really, really important. And just a quick side note, right, that I want to make is that if we're speaking about making the industry more fair, like what is fair? Uh, Currently, people all across the world can access DeFi, right? There are no, not really access barriers apart maybe from internet connections or hardware devices being lacking. But again, distribution of funds is is different, um, especially if you're raising capital. So if we're speaking about fairness and access, like, do we want to create equal opportunity per se for everyone? Or do we just want to have the initial access um, opportunities in place? And then it's up to individuals as to how they tap or don't tap into the opportunities that Web3 offer. And that is almost, again, a philosophical or political discussion to be had. And I personally believe that and I'm very much in favor of giving people uh, equal opportunity, especially there where we see access barriers, right? In Web3 space, it's so important who you are, where you're based and who you know. I think that is absolutely detrimental and that is a big opportunity cost for the Web3 space speaking generally. And that is actually why I think that we as individuals must always be step up be stepping up for ourselves, but also why I built Thrill Labs as this free and open access business platform where anyone really who is professionally involved who wants to be with Web3 can connect with those individuals that you're looking for in a more streamlined and efficient and fairer kind of like way. So long story short, (laughs) 
they're the matter of being empowered, but also a matter of stepping up, stepping up for ourselves. And it's almost like a political discussion, generally, how you would define fair and inclusive and equal. I really, really love your answer because, you know, it comes, it does come down to definition. What is fair? What is the definition of, of fair and what does it look like in practice, right? And, and the thing with inclusive, because, you know, we can be given equal opportunities, but it's also our, our job, you know, and, and it's up to us to be motivated enough to step up, as you said. So there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a slight paradox as well, you know, in the the equality and inequality, because there will be a little bit of inequality because it depends on the human's um, motivation, right? But, you know, and then, so coming to like, you know, what what are some major obstacles to widespread adoption of decentralized technologies? Because, you know, we kind of mentioned that technology is, it's just a tool, you know, and how can they be addressed? I think this is an extremely interesting remark, Aliana, that you just put out there, that there is still a bit of inequality because it's up to us to step up or to tap into opportunity. And I think that as a Web3 industry, we should probably not be, and as founders, right, let let me speak for myself, I shouldn't be that almost arrogant to think that everyone must be into Web3 or everyone should be even wanted to be empowered by the revolution that we're building. A lot of people don't care. Or maybe they um, they are not so interested. Or maybe, you know, they are just preoccupied in their daily lives with uh, their family duties or anything else that kind of like consumes them from an ideological or just practical working perspective. And that actually maybe brings me immediately to some of the adoption yeah, challenges that, you know, you know, that we must mention is that indeed, it is also really a method of realizing that not the whole world per se needs or wants crypto and all sorts of decentralized projects. If we look at Web3 adoption between, for instance, certain African countries versus uh, countries in Europe, in Scandinavia, right? We do see a lot of differing adoptions. And why is that? Well, because certain people in certain countries have different needs. Some need to be empowered from a financial inclusion and banking perspective. Others may fundamentally just want to make money uh, and invest. Uh, some others may lack digital identities or identities whatsoever. Think about global refugees in the world to a great extent, many of them at least, while others maybe want to build beautiful refi projects in South America. So I do think that it's really important to, yeah, keep into mind crypto can be a life changer. Blockchain and Web3 as almost like political movements also aim to change the world, but how individuals actually adopt all sorts of verticals is really depending on the situation and on it and kind of like any contextual factors. Of course, we can look more generally and that's, I will try to keep this as short as possible and just take into consideration once more that Web3 is really of a social technological nature. So there's always going to be this tension with regulation right? That can be an enabler or actually a challenger for adoption. Internal factors such as, you know, how good or bad the the blockchain technology works. Are there any bugs? Are there any rock pools happening, right? That kind of like undermine adoption and trust in the industry. Um, Again, we spoke about good UX, to which extent that is important, UX and UI. And really in the thinking about yeah, the contextual factors and uh, what is really widespread adoption. Do we want everyone to use crypto as an alternative to fiat currencies? Do we want individuals to tap into Web3 projects almost as alternatives to big Web2 companies? It all depends on the con- con- contextual factors and again, of definitions. And it's again, almost like a philosophical and political discussion. I guess I can become a bit repetitive, but uh, I guess that I'm also quite informed by my background in this case. No, I love the, you know, philosophical um, side of things, right? Um, And I'm so, you know, I'm really enjoying this conversation. And it kind of brings me back to, you know, some people or some communities, um, you know, it's not necessarily they want freedom. They just want better leaders, you know? So, you know, coming back to your point about like, you know, not everyone uh, needs decentralization technology. Not everyone wants to to adopt it, and you know, uh, and I think we're at a really unique time and place where we can experiment, and and there is space 
uh, for that innovation to happen, right? So it brings me to, you know, what emerging trends or innovations could help overcome these challenges of decentralization in Web3? Uh, this is absolutely wonderful what you just said about uh, better leaders, right? Ultimately, so much is up to that, up to individuals having this vision about whether or not they want to bring their community forward or their nation state or their political party. And I think that the same we probably see happening within blockchain companies, especially the bigger ones or smaller ones. And what you've noted about trends and innovations, I think, of course, you know, we can look at technological innovations. Of course, we see more and more, especially if we think about efficiency and scalability and governance, we see layer twos, more and more DAOs being implemented. We see more and more interoperability, uh, being able to bridge different types of uh, ecosystems and projects. I'm personally also quite a fan of Internet Computer Protocol, uh, just because it provides, you know, the... Um, a better, let's say, infrastructural layer for the deployment of projects and whatnot. Um, and in fact, at Thrill Labs, we will be deploying our platform over there because I remain that it's a huge paradox that we have all this decentralized project with huge ambitions. But then if you look at where the data is hosted, it's like on AWS, right? I mean, that is really paradoxical in my opinion, but understandable given the financial cost and whatnot. And again, the scalability, but just to, to, to go back to your main question, I think that more from a, not, so, not necessarily technological perspective, but more from a use case perspective, we do see also these more yeah, user facing apps, like indeed my own app, um, our platform trail, other types of apps that are not necessarily super sexy and will get you rich overnight, right? But that are just the kind of apps that try to provide real use cases to people. And I do think that that is really a new type of innovation. Sometimes people won't even know anymore that they are using blockchain infrastructure under certain types of applications in, let's say, in terms of NFTs or booking tickets and whatnot. I'm personally a little bit less interested in these types of applications. I'm very obsessed with, let's say, the life-changing, um, society-making better applications of free five social impact, of allowing people for instance to raise funds in decentralized ways. But I think that where we see the less obvious use case of blockchain, I think for a lot of people in terms of mainstream adoption, that is probably a highly emerging trend. And again, if you are not necessarily happy as an individual with certain trends or innovations, I do want to highlight here is that you can always step up and build something yourself, especially if you have an idea of what is needed or what you care about. I personally couldn't imagine a couple of years ago that I would be sitting here today, that I would have raised capital, that I was building a decentralized team, launching a token. Wow. You know, so I do think that there is a lot up to us to kind of like step up and create these new trends or innovations or projects. And the space is welcoming to everyone. Uh, I've maybe been a bit critical here and there, but I do think that Web3 is the best industry to work on. People generally, nine out of nine point nine out of ten people, if we want to just <laughs> cut people in pieces, are really nice, welcoming, and helping and collaborative. So there's space for anyone to step up and really build and build that future of tomorrow. I believe. Yeah, I love that, and and it brings me to the uh, quote of. Um, uh, be the change you want to see in the world, right? And that's that's you, you know, your version of stepping up, right? So it's been a really wonderful conversation. And I'd just like to ask if you've got any final thoughts or advice um, for our listeners uh, about Web3 businesses and, and, you know, building a Web3 business. Oh, that is lovely. Thank you for that opportunity. I think I've been speaking a lot today, so... I feel I will just keep this very brief. Uh, I think that based upon, let's say, all the hopeful things I've been saying, all the more critical reflections I've been trying to uh, put into words, I think the most important perhaps takeaway from my perspective is that you know, Web3 is wonderful, but it's really important to have almost like a very balanced understanding and not necessarily completely utopian or dystopian about its potential and its challenges, right? It's Web3 is ultimately built by humans uh, that have different beliefs, different wants, different interests, different backgrounds. They're located in different parts of the world. 
And that is just shaped by this complex interplay of not only the tech, but also the human and the entities and financial interests at times that those humans really represent. And of course, uh, I would quickly like to mention that anyone who is interested in finding potential, you know, business partners, collaborations, um, investors, jobs, whatever, feel free to check out Trilled. It's free. It's open access. Um, we're becoming decentralized and Web3 uh, right now as we speak. So we would love to just help you and help you connect with people um, globally so that hopefully, you know, you lose less time. You find the people that you're needing, that you're looking for. And uh, yeah, hopefully you can get some nice exposure for either yourself as an individual or as a, as a company, be it just from your chair or indeed at an event, because we collaborate with lots of events uh, too, which is a whole different topic to perhaps step into another time. So thank you so much for having had me. It was really wonderful to speak with you and to be welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Alexandra. And, you know, and I know for a fact that our listeners will be in your good hands, um, you know. Uh, so thank you so much for shedding light on the realities of doing business. Three, and thank you for, you know, taking the time to be here with us today and to all our fantastic listeners. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. Don't forget to express your support by liking, subscribing and sharing this episode. Thank you for tuning in and until we meet again, stay well.